If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And ever since I knew what God wanted me to speak on this morning, I've tried not to think about it too much. And one of these days, he might let me preach a sermon that doesn't preach to me so much. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. When the Holy Spirit speaks, it tends to hit a bunch of us, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to read a passage of scripture written by the great Apostle Paul. I mean, this is a guy who accomplished many great things for Christ. And if you know his background story of where the Lord brought him from, I mean, he was one of the main ones persecuting believers everywhere, men and women and children, it didn't matter. Uh, He was adamantly opposed to this new thing called Christians. And he had that blinding experience on the road to Damascus and God called him to lead Christians and to write most of the New Testament. You better be careful what you oppose when it comes to you you and God fighting because God might just put a calling on your life. (laughs) I had a critic many years ago that criticized a sermon after I preached it. He met me as soon as I finished preaching, and he just, boy, he just let me have it. I mean, I'd never had anything quite like that. And I I thought to myself, you better be careful, or God will call you to preach. And last I heard, that's what he's doing. (laughs) So I don't know how, that wasn't in my notes. (laughs) I'm at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. If you're there, say amen with me. Amen. I want to uh, read the first 10 or so verses and just remain seated for the first part. Paul is in the middle of boasting. If you look back in chapter 11, he's boasting about his sufferings. In fact, I have a heading in my Bible that says Paul boasts about his sufferings. And in chapter 12, he carries on with this boasting a bit. He starts to explain how God has used those sufferings in his life. And if you want a full list of his sufferings, you can back up and read about him being hungry and without food and cold and naked and in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, etc., A lot of sufferings. Let's pick up in verse 1. I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ, and theologians believe he is actually speaking of himself here. He's trying to be humble about this. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Now, in Jewish culture, the third heaven would be the very dwelling place of God. The first heavens would be what you and I see birds fly in, the firmament, the sky. The second heavens being what you or I would call outer space. But the third heaven was the very dwelling place of God. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. And there's a word we can all get a picture of. He heard inexpressible things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself except about my Weaknesses. Does anybody have weaknesses in here? Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. 
But I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. And that word is translated in some translations as buffet. In the Greek, it's a word that speaks of a beating, being beaten. And if you would, would you stand for the remainder of this, just a couple of verses here, two or three. I'm at verse eight. He said, I received, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Verse eight says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. And he describes what his thorn or thorns were. He said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in case he left anything out, he said, and in difficulties. Those are thorns. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I want to speak to you on the subject of thorns. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you go with us through this life as an ever-present help You have given us your spirit, the great paraclete, to come alongside us and help us as we journey through the difficulties and the weaknesses and the hardships and the persecutions. And God, as we read in your word that your servant Paul boasted in these things, we pause to thank you for the thorns, whatever they may be, because we know that they will serve your great purpose in our lives in the end. Help us to be sanctified by your word and by your spirit now, and it is in Jesus' name we all pray. And everybody said amen. You know, as we think about the Apostle Paul, we think about a pretty strong guy, don't we? I don't know if you've ever studied his ministry, but I did. I remember distinctly the grade I got on the paper I wrote. In Bible college, it was not to my liking, but it was my grade nonetheless. But I studied his missionary travels and his ministry in different places, the miracles that he performed or that Jesus worked through him. And I'll be honest with you, he is not the kind of person that I would think of in terms of someone saying, not only am I weak, but I boast about being weak. And uh, I have uh, thought a lot about this weakness. I've been praying about some things in my life that, you know, after a while, you kind of just get tired. You pray and pray and pray, and you feel weaker and weaker and weaker. And I saw somebody had sent a, a picture. It's a meme or whatever you call it. It was a picture of someone with their hands up like they're praying. You may have seen this on social media, but the caption read, Lord, give me patience, because if you give me strength, I'm going to need bail money to go with it. (laughs) And I can probably relate to that, too. And I remember when I was younger and I don't remember, I don't know who I was talking to just recently about this. And I, I said, yeah, when I was your age, I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof, too. And the older you get the more you realize your frailty, don't you? Some of you in our congregation have had, you know, the ailments that come with aging that make you to where you say things like, I just can't do what I used to could. Used to could has become quite a word in my own vocabulary. (laughs) I used to could. 
And I have learned that maybe it's not so bad to know your weaknesses because knowing your limitations can save your life. <laughs> because sometimes some of you have heard you talk about it. You get out there and you start doing what you used to could. And the next thing you know, you find out I can't do what I used to could. And sometimes, you know, we, we don't, uh, we don't like to think that we can't do that anymore. I mean, we just don't, we like to think we can still do what we need to do physically. Well, the same is true spiritually. I don't think any of us just really look at our spiritual life and want to go, you know, I just can't do what I used to could. Because we like to think that we're strong. I, I remember thinking, I've had times in my life when I thought, man, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm, I've prayed and I've fasted and I'm, I'm ready to whip any demon that thinks he wants a piece of me. And, you know, all the verses that we quote, if God is for me, who can be against me? And no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Look out, devil, I'm coming after you. I don't think that's a verse in the Bible, but it just kind of goes with that. And then you experience what I call a 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 problem. I didn't read that verse. But that's the one that says, Therefore let, he, let, he, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. <laughs> and so you've got your feet firmly planted in the faith one minute, and the next thing you know, you feel like Samson after a bad haircut. You just feel kind of tired and weak and you're, you, you know, you come to church and you kind of get fired up. You hear some preaching and singing and fellowship of believers and you go out on Monday ready to whip the devil. And about Wednesday or Thursday, you know, when he shows up in your life for really good, you, you kind of go, well, uh, hang on, wait till next Sunday. <laughs> I heard a story about Little Johnny telling his friend, my daddy has a list of everybody he can whip. I may have told you this. His friend said, is my dad on that list? He said, he sure is. And his friend said, well, he can't whip my dad. And little Johnny said, well, he's on the list. So the friend went home and told his dad. Little Johnny's dad has a list of everybody he can whip. And his dad said, is my name on that list? He said, it sure is. He said, well, he can't whip me. So the friend's dad went to see little Johnny's dad. Knocked on the door. Little Johnny's dad opened the door and said, your son told my son that you have a list with everybody's name on it that you can whip. He said, I sure do. He said, is my name on that list? He said, it sure is. He said, well, you can't whip me. And little Johnny's dad said, oh, well, I'll take your name off the list then. <laughs> and sometimes that's just about how we fight the devil. I'm ready to whip him until he shows up. And then we go, well, I'll just take your name off the list then. I was reading about the people of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And I don't want to turn there for the sake of time, but I encourage you to go there and read it for yourself. These were great men and women of faith. And as you read down through that chapter, it, there's kind of this repeated statement throughout. By faith, this person did this and such. By faith, this person did that. By faith, this person did this. And each one is listed for their greatness, for what they've accomplished through faith. These are faith giants. But as you read down through there, you get down a ways and there's something that you just almost feel like God put that in there by mistake. But he didn't. If you get all the way down to verse 33, it's talking about how they, through faith, subdued kingdoms. Through faith, worked righteousness. 
through faith obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. Woo! Hallelujah. We can say amen to that, can't we? Through faith, they quenched the violence of fire and escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They might obtain a better resurrection. I don't know if you caught it, but apparently through faith, out of weakness, they were made strong. God puts thorns in our lives. Paul described his and one of them, kind of the, I think the overarching thing that he used to describe his thorns was the word weakness. Whatever this thorn was, it was a weakness. It made him feel weak. And some of you have been through some things that left you feeling weak. I just want you to know apparently you're in good company because I bet you never thought of people like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses as being people who were acquainted with weakness. But apparently all of those faith giants in Hebrews 11 were men and women who through great weakness were made strong men and women of God. So I want to talk to you about thorns, and I just want to begin with how God uses thorns for his glory. And as I talk about thorns, I want you to think about the words that Paul used to describe what his thorn was. Words like weakness and words like hardships and persecutions and difficulties. How many of you know God uses those things in your life? Paul wrote to them an earlier letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he said that God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And he did that so that no flesh should glory in his presence. I think as long as you are strong enough to handle it, you're taking glory away from God. And God wants to bring you through things in such a way that the world, when it comes to the end, will see that it is only by the hand of God that you came through it. God doesn't want to just bring you through things. He wants to bring you through in such a way that all of the glory goes to him. That's what living for Christ means. It's, it's that God, I want you, Lord, I want you to receive all of the glory that you can get from my life. Now, Paul talks about it and describes it as weakness. And a lot of people in the Bible could relate to that. In the Bible, in fact, in the book of Judges, there's a story that I'm sure you've all, you probably remember from Sunday school flannel graph board days. And it's the story of Gideon. I love the story of Gideon, and I'm not going to turn there and read it for the sake of time. I'm just going to use it as an example. But you may remember that God called Gideon to lead his people in battle against the Midianites. And Gideon's reply, basically, if I could paraphrase it in the Todd Steffi paraphrase, Gideon basically said, well, God, I, I can't do that because, you see, my tribe is the least of all the tribes. My family is the least of all the families of my tribe. And I'm the least of my family. And Gideon, as the story goes, starts out with 32,000 men to defeat the Gideon, the Midianites. Now listen, the Midianites had 135,000 in case you forgot this story. 135,000 to Gideon's 32,000. And what did God say to Gideon? He said, you have too much for me to do this. You're too strong. So Gideon, in order for me to do what I want to do in your life, I'm going to have to weaken you a bit. 
I know this doesn't preach good, but a little amen every once in a while would sure help me. <laughs> for me to get all the glory for what I'm about to do, I need to reduce the number of people you have with you and make your army weaker than it already is. And so God's, God worked it out and you know, said, just tell everybody that who's afraid to go home. 22,000 left. <laughs> and Gideon's probably taking note of this and how many he has left. And, and he's thinking, <clears throat> okay, this is, this is, boy, it's going to be your glory now, God, because we don't have enough. And God says, no, 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 no. You're, you're still a little too strong. So take them down to the watering hole and everybody who puts their face down to drink set them aside and everybody who pulls the water up to their mouth to drink set them aside and God said now all those men who were busy drinking instead of looking over the horizon send them home and he was left with 300 men come on God do the math I mean I'm weak now, God. I'm, I'm, this is it, man. You talk about a thorn. I mean, I don't have but 300 men against 135,000. God, why am I so overwhelmed in this battle? And could it just be that God is orchestrating the circumstances of your life so that you are absolutely aware of just how weak you are so that when this battle is over and Everybody will then know whose strength won this battle. As you go through things, you need to keep in mind, it is not just about your victory. It is about his glory. God has chosen the weak things in order that no flesh may glory in his presence. It is not just about your victory. It is about his glory. God wants to reveal his glory to the world through your life. I think about Goliath. Did it ever occur to you that God could have used that whole army to defeat Goliath? I mean, God could have just moved among those soldiers so that the whole army just swooped down off the hillside and just clobbered this giant. But he got way more glory by putting a weak little 13 or 14 year old boy in front of him with a slingshot and five stones. Because God has chosen the weak things. Not, he, he's not looking for men and women of great strength. He's looking for men and women that he can put a thorn in their side. A weakness of some kind, a difficulty of some kind, so, so that the world will know through whom this great victory came. God wants to do it in such a way that he gets the most glory out of it. So God uses thorns for his glory, but I also want to mention that he uses thorns for our good. Let me talk about that a minute. One commentator said, it is when we are conscious of our own weakness and nothingness that we most depend on the power of God. <clears throat> it is when we are thus cast on him in complete dependence that his power is manifested to us and we are truly strong. So God uses our weaknesses, our difficulties, our thorns for our ultimate good. Now, for this one, I'm going to take you to a really bad place in the Bible. Since I brought up David as a boy facing Goliath, let me bring up David as a man facing Bathsheba. I mean, really? God, I made it past that giant, and now there's Uriah's wife. This is the kind of story that makes for a good movie. It has the 
illicit affair, the unexpected pregnancy, the murder of Bathsheba's husband Uriah. And this is the same boy, the same David who as a boy stood before Goliath. And it's the same David that God describes as the apple of his eye, a man after God's own heart. And in David's weakness, I'm not suggesting here that God gave him that weakness. But in that weakness, talk about a thorn. And in that failure, God worked a work of grace in David's life that would become a picture of grace for generation, generations to come. Another way God uses our weakness, our thorns, for our good is because it brings us to the end of ourselves. God wants to bring you to the end of yourself, your own ability, your own strength. In order to do that, he will give us circumstances to magnify our weaknesses, our difficulties, our hardships, our persecutions, our insults, so that we cannot fight this in our own strength. You remember the story of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, <clears throat> the people of Moab and the Ammonites together came against Jehoshaphat and the people of God. And Jehoshaphat called a nationwide fast and he went to the house of the Lord and he prayed. In fact, if you listen to his prayer, it's, it is a confession of weakness. It is a confession of that this is bigger than me. He said, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. He's going to God and he is saying, I can't fight this one. I don't have the strength. We don't have the power. Listen, when you have a thorn in your life that leaves you weak and, and you're unable to deal with it, the one thing you can always do is pray. In fact, nothing will develop your prayer life like running out of strength, like a thorn that's bigger than you. And so becoming aware of your weakness and your difficulties, that, that's actually what will turn you to God. God uses thorns to turn you to him. God uses thorns in your life for your own good. Thorns grow your faith. So as he's praying, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel and God began to speak through him. And he, he said this, this is what the Lord said to them. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude for the battle is not yours, but God's. And I love what he said next. You won't even need to fight in this one. Position yourselves, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. And then I want you to see too that you need to learn to delight in thorns. Now watch this. Paul said as he's talking about this thorn in the flesh, and he describes it as a messenger of Satan. By the way, the Bible is silent on exactly what his thorn is. Different theologians have suggested different things. Uh, many believe it was some kind of a body, bodily ailment or a physical condition, which I think is quite interesting coming from a man who God used to heal, miraculously heal, so many people. My great grandmother used to say, I've prayed for people. They had a, a round of the seven year itch that came through where she pastored. And my great grandmother said, I've prayed for many people that God healed with the seven, healed of the seven year itch while I was eat up with it. <laughs> I don't even know what the seven year itch was, but it sounds awful.
But I want you to see that as he's listing, he says, it's a messenger of Satan to torment me, to beat me. And as he's listing his descriptors of his thorns, I, I mentioned weaknesses, insults, hardships, and persecutions, difficulties, but I want you to see these four words at the beginning of his list in verse 10. That is why for Christ's sake, watch these four words. I delight in weaknesses. You understand that God wants you, now this is hard for me to even preach. God wants me and you to delight in thorns. Whatever your thorn is, whatever difficulty you're facing, whatever your miserable difficulty that's just about to do you in, you can't stand it much longer and you pray and you pray and life just gets harder and harder. Mm, hardships, that's one of the words. But Paul says, I delight in these. So I want to talk about delighting, learning to delight in thorns. So this whole section is really a description of Paul's life. All the humiliation, the painfulness. And... The Lord allows him, he, you know, he's had these surpassing revelations, these visions. He's been taken up into heaven and seen the things that are going on in the heavenlies and all these d divine revelations from God. And then God allows him to suffer some thorn in the flesh. How many of you have ever been pricked by a thorn? I think that's a pretty good description of all these difficulties that he's talking about and hardships. Now we learned some valuable lessons here, <laughs> none the least of which is the divine revelations do not always take care of the thorns of the flesh. <laughs> you can come to church and you can know the scriptures, you can quote scriptures, you can pray scriptures and you're still going to have thorns in your life. And so we won't escape the thorns. So we have to learn to delight in them. Now, what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? We don't know for sure. We know that it was some kind of weakness, some kind of difficulty, some kind of hardship. And we know that God, I'm going to preach something else that doesn't preach real good. <laughs> we know that God allowed it. In fact, not only did God allow it, but Paul pleaded with God. Now, this is a praying man. Paul is a man who's got his prayer life in order. And he said, I pleaded with God three times to please God. Please, God, take this away. Get me out of this. Deliver me from this. Take it away from me. I must say I have outprayed Paul on some of those occasions in my life. I've prayed more than three times. I've pleaded with God. I know what it means to plead with God. And I've, I've probably outdone him on the number of times. Maybe it's because I don't listen as well as Paul did. And even though he's pleading and pleading and pleading, Apparently, God is just kind of silent in some of this. You ever, you ever stop to thank God for unanswered prayers? I'm, I'm going to say something about unanswered prayers for just a minute here, and this may be a little bit of a rabbit trail, but what if you ask God to take away this thing that feels like it's beating you up? That's how Paul described it. And you're, you're pleading with him, and God doesn't do what you're asking him to do. I preached a sermon on this, I believe, recently, where I talked to you about surrendering to the king greater than you. And, and, and we think of unanswered prayers as being prayers that were harmful, you know, things that God knew we didn't need. 
But I promise you the hardships, the difficulties, the weaknesses, all those things that Paul's describing as a thorn. I promise you when you have a thorn in your life and you're praying and pleading, God, take this away. Bring this to an end, God. I promise you're probably not standing there going, you know, this is probably one of those thorns that God's not going to take away. And in effect, and I want you to know, it, it, sometimes when God doesn't answer, how many of you know that no answer is an answer? I remember as a child, I'd be in a store or something. I was just a little boy, and I'd ask my dad for something that I wanted. and Daddy, can I have a whatever? And he'd just kind of ignore me. Daddy, daddy, daddy. Daddy, can I have daddy? Can I, daddy, will you get me? And eventually, I remember this well, he'd look at me and go, no, you've done asked me too many times now. <laughs> I didn't understand that as a kid, but you know, as I grow up, I realized that no answer is an answer. If you ask somebody, do you love me? And they don't answer you, guess what? They answered you. And God, in essence, answered Paul's prayer. Listen, I, I'm not, no, no, I'm not going to remove this thorn. But I will do something better. I will give you grace to bear it. Oh. Oh, God, I don't want to bear it. Take this thorn away, God. No, I, my grace is absolutely sufficient. God was more interested in teaching the great apostle Paul something about his grace than he was about removing the thorn from his life. Just remember, Paul, no matter what you go through, no matter how it makes you feel, no matter what this thorn does to you emotionally or spiritually or, you know, physically or whatever it is, whatever it is you're going through, this thorn is going to work a greater purpose in your life because God uses thorns for our good. And he needed somebody to write some books in the New Testament that knew something about God's Grace. And this was God's repeated answer to his prayer that he prayed at least three times, and it continues to be God's answer to people who are suffering through this world. You see, better than removing the trials and the sufferings, better than removing the thorns, is having the grace of God that gives you his strength to bear it. I love these words. My grace is sufficient for you. That means completely satisfied. And so Paul says, therefore, because that was his answer to my prayer, I will boast in my thorns. I will delight in my thorns, my weaknesses, my difficulties. The world's philosophy, as Oswald Sanders put it, the world's philosophy is what can't be cured must be endured. But Paul testifies, listen, what can't be cured can be enjoyed. Do you mean I have to enjoy my thorn? God, you want me to enjoy? That's what delight in means, is it not? I delight in these things. I, he lists them, hardships, difficulties, weaknesses. And he said, I delight. I've learned by the grace of God to delight in these things. Well, naturally speaking, in fact, one translation puts it, take pleasure in. 
How many of you know that 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 really in the natural is quite impossible for us to take pleasure? I've never I've never reached into a rose bush, got stuck by a thorn and get, and went, oh well, hallelujah. I might have said something else. And God expects me to to rejoice, to delight in, to rejoice in, to take pleasure in thorns. I've got to I've got to bring this to an end. I don't like being made so aware of my weaknesses. I too am getting to an age where I used to could is used much more frequently. And now when I do what I used to could, the effects last so much longer than it used to last. God makes us aware of our thorns because it is not just about our victory, it is about His glory. Paul had plenty to say about this. He talked and talked about weaknesses. He talked and talked about sufferings in his life. I remember years ago, it's been, in fact, I can give you the date. It was in November 2014. I remember it very well. I had been at work. It was a Friday night. It was late. I got home late. It was probably around midnight. I got out of my car and I stood in the driveway where I lived at the time. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart about some things I'd been praying about. I'd been praying about some specific things in my life and, and as I stood there in the driveway just listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit, he began to remind me of some things and I have not really talked about this much publicly as your pastor but when I was when I was a baby when I was born I nearly died my mother nearly died at my childbirth at my birth because I was turned wrong and back then there wasn't a whole lot they could do but as I stood in the driveway in 2014 one of the things that God said to me was, I have called you even from your mother's womb when the enemy would have destroyed you. And he went on to say, and I, I'll never forget this, he said, and though it has not been easy. Now remember, I was praying about some specific I guess I could say thorns in my life, some specific things. And he said, and although it has not been easy, I brought you the hard way for it was the better way. Wednesday night in our Bible study, I teach a Bible study here at the church and we don't video those for social media, but I, or our media ministry, but I, I've been teaching on Genesis and last Wednesday <clears throat> we were studying the passage in Genesis 47 where Joseph brings his elderly father Jacob to meet Pharaoh and as he stood before Pharaoh he asked Pharaoh asked Jacob how old are you and Jacob said the years of my pilgrimage are 130 And he describes those 130 years like this. He said, my years have been few and difficult. Difficult. Jacob had thorns. And the word translated difficult, in the King James it's evil. It doesn't really speak or imply wickedness, but it speaks of misery and distressfulness. It's 130 years, that's how long my pilgrimage has been and my years have been very distressing and very difficult. Misery, miserable. And I think Paul would have related to this. But I want you to hear this one more time 
as Paul says, I was given this thorn for one thing, to keep me from becoming conceited, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to beat me. I pleaded with God three times, take it away. His answer, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my thorns. He said, that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in my thorns, weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties, because when I am weak, in fact, let me say it in kind of a modern way that I think says it even more. It is only when I am weak that I am truly strong. And so I will praise God for the thorns in my life because without them, we would never know Christ's power resting on us. You have thorns in your life on purpose, but this life is not all there is. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you have had thorns in your life? Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I, I just, <clears throat> I pause, we pause in your presence to thank you. And we don't thank you just for the joyous times or the easy, peaceful times. We, we thank you for the thorns. We thank you for the difficulties, the persecutions, the weaknesses we feel. And I pray, God, that you will somehow work these thorns in our lives. We want you to take them away, but God, if you see fit to leave them, then we, we will trust that you're going to use those thorns in such a way to ultimately bring about your great glory in our lives. And we want to see Christ's power resting on us, as Paul said. We want that. We want your power in our lives. And if it takes thorns to have that, then so be it. And God, we will praise you and we will trust you. We will thank you. And we will keep believing that your grace is still sufficient to get us through any thorn that we may face. I pray a blessing over these people. I pray, God, that you'll watch over them and keep them safe in this distressing time in which we live. And I pray, God, that you'll bring us back safely to your house where we will gather in your name and we will see the miracles done for your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you.